Good morning, saints. Please stand if you're able and join me in our call to worship. And please remain standing also if you're able for our praise in song. Come and worship all you who love and serve the Lord, outsiders and insiders, old timers and newcomers, the young, old, and the in between. Come as you are, but this is God's house, a house of prayer for all people, and people, and God welcomes each one who comes. Let us worship him. Amen? Amen. Our praise song is I don't know what you come to do. I don't know what you come to do. Now, this is an old song, church, but it has a updated twist to it. So, musicians, if you would just start the song, musicians, I don't know what you come to do. It says, I come to sing my song. Did you come to sing your song? It says, I come to clap my hands. Did you come to clap your hands? I come to do my dance. Did you come to do your dance? If so, please join me, the choir, as we sing. I don't know what you come to do, but I came here to praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand up of praise. He's worthy to be praised, church. He's worthy to be praised. Amen. To do. I don't know what you come to do. Hey, hey, I don't know what you come to do. I don't know what you come to do. I come to clap my hands. I come to clap my hands. I come to do my dance. I come to do my dance.
Good morning, baby. Good morning. Grim P is putting everything off on me this morning, but that's all right. <laughs> God's good all the time. All the time, God is good. Welcome, Bailey. Those who are worshiping with us in person and those who are worshiping with us uh, virtually. We thank God for you, even though the weather is kind of foul, but God had to send some rain sometime. If he didn't send rain, it'd be a desert. And if he didn't send sunshine and all, the ecosystem wouldn't balance itself out. So God knows what he's doing. And if you're like Paul, Paul spent 14 days in a nor'easter where he couldn't even see the sky, the sun, the moon, or anything else. But he had his complete trust in God because God, an angel of God, had visited him and told him that you're going to make it to Rome. The ship might be destroyed, but no lives would be lost. And if you can trust God to bring you through the sunshine, he can bring you through the rain as well. We want to say thank you for all of those, all of you that are here today. All of you, those of you who are worshiping with us by other means. Matthew 24 talks about wars and rumors of wars and storms increasing and all of the other things that are going on now because it's closer for Jesus' return today than it was yesterday. And make no mistake about it, he is coming back. And when he comes back, there will be no salvation. There won't be a little bitty baby in a manger. He's coming back as a conquering king. And he's going to slay his enemies. That's why in Revelation it says the blood will fill the streets up to the horse's bridle. Evil people are going to be slain. And God is going to rule supreme. So let us go to God this morning. Our Father and our God, we come this morning to say, Hallowed be your holy and your righteous name. You're holy and you're righteous. You're a God of love, but you're also a God of wrath. Even though you love us beyond compare, you still can't allow sin to run rapid in our lives. There has to be some checks and balances, and God, you provide them before us. But for those of us who realize that there is shelter in the name of Jesus, because he hides us from the wrath of God, and if we would only put our trust in him, one day we will stand before Almighty God. God does not look at us, but he looks at what Jesus accomplished on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for this day, even though it might be raining, even though some people might want to complain about it. But Lord, you've taught us to be thankful in all things. To give thanks for things we understand and those we may not understand as well. And we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for being able to go down to the breakfast table this morning and enjoy a meal. And we had shelter and clothing and umbrellas and all to help us get from one place to another. And God, we say, much obliged, my father. That may not be enough, but thank you for your blessings. We pray now for our congregation. We pray for our pastor and our leaders. We pray that you will continue to enlighten them. And for those of you who are missing out on our Zoom Sunday school, we had a very good lesson this morning about childlike faith. And we had some very good illustrations to demonstrate that children are faithful 
And our Bible tells us that out of the mouths of babes and sucklings come perfected praise. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be that beacon that's sitting on a hill that may be attracting others to you because it's not about us, it's about you. We thank you for giving our pastor the vision and the leadership, the strength and the courage, my Father, to stand when others may want to quit. We know your word says where two or three are gathered in your name, touching and agreeing on the same thing, there you would be in the midst. And we know that you walk among the golden candlesticks because as John the Revelator said you do. And we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to witness to your holy and your righteous name, to tell some man, woman, boy, or girl that Jesus is alive and well. Well, how do you know he's alive and well, preacher? Because I can feel him moving on the altar of my heart. He moves, he walks with me, he talks with me, and he leads me along life's narrow way. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The page will do our first scripture reading. Scripture number one, Luke eight, one, two, three. Now it came to pass afterward, and he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the gold tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women who were healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come several demons, seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chuzza, Herod Stewart and Susanna and many others who provided for him from their substance. Let us stand by our Apostles' Creed. And what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this there come the judge, the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our second scripture reading comes from Luke 8, 41 through 48. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitude thronged him. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who has spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any came from behind and touched the border of his garment and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, master, the multitude throng and press you and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touch me, for I receive power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She decided to him in presence of all people the reason she had touched him and how she had healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith had made you well. Go in peace. He has announcements. Good morning. 
Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Thank these ministers of the gospel for their faithfulness. Let me thank all of you for being here, for being a part of our worship service in person and in all the ways that we're able to gather. Let me thank you all for coming out despite what my mom used to call that getting you sick weather. We do have a few announcements. Another one of our partners in the community, Habitat for Humanity, sends us his letter of thanks. All of us at Habitat for Humanity of Tuscaloosa extend our sincere gratitude for your congregation's donation through the ba Bailey Benevolence Fund to our organization. We will use this donation to help fund Operation Transformation. Although we had originally planned to build 40 homes in Tuscaloosa's West End, through this unique initiative, that number now has increased to 75. Um, the women of the church will meet today, uh, immediately after morning worship in the sanctuary. You're asked to meet on the left side. I assume that's my left, or maybe that's, no, that's y'all's left. So please meet on this side, because there'll be some traffic in and out of Olden Mesa. The food ministry, again, is accepting donations and or um, donations of money and or non-perishable items. If you're bringing non-perishable items, you can replace them in the Baskets located in the sanctuary for you and the Olamay Thomas Children's Center for you. Please remember to designate your offering, um, the amount that you want to go to the food ministry. And those distribution dates will be April 1st and April 8th. Um, the Women's Missionary Society will walk from March 1st to March 17th. Understand that you all have already started that and your donations are welcome. Do any of the missionaries want to explain how we can make a donation to what that walk is it a pledge who are the team leaders Okay, so Sister Jackie Williams, Sister Jackie Hobson Williams, and you. All right, so we just give you cash. Do we sign up or something? Yeah, we want to do it. You were asked to fund them by donating $1 per mile. Each missionary is asked to walk 5 miles and donate $1 per mile. Okay. So we have to do it every single day. Okay, well, one of y'all catch me before I leave. It's $5 per mile? mile. Five dollars per mile, and every missionary is asked to walk a minimum of how many? All right, so twenty-five bucks. All right, after after worship, I'm going to my office, get my wallet. Whoever catches me first, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, March is Women's History Month, uh, and observing this occasion, Sister Danielle Steele Williams is Dr. Trudia Harris. We do a book signing on the third Sunday, that is next Sunday, March 19th. Official board meets today via Zoom at 2 p.m. April 9th, Easter Sunday, worship will begin at 9.30 a.m. Um, there will be no Sunday school. Let me say it again. On Easter Sunday, we will have early morning worship. We'll start at 9.30, and we will not have Sunday school. That's Sunday, but Sunday school will meet the Thursday before at 6 p.m. It is 6 p.m. by Zoom, okay? So just like we did for, for Christmas, we'll do early service. This Tuesday, Bailey Tabernacle is hosting the Linton Luncheon. The Linton Luncheon is an interfaith, interchurch fellowship during the season of Lent. Last Tuesday, we were at Brown Memorial by Stillman. This Tuesday, we'll be here. Let me thank the missionaries for sponsoring the food for that. We will have... Uh, interfaith friends there. If you're interested in attending, it's a free light lunch. Um, please let myself and or Sister Wilson know so that we can adjust any of the numbers with our food. And it is open, free to the public. That's at noon. It's just an hour. There'll be fellowship, food, and a brief Bible study. Let's see. Do we have a women's history moment today? Amen. Well, then, before our stewards come for the offering, let me just take a point of personal privilege. 
Uh, riding up here Thursday, I was looking at my car's um, mileage. And I put a lot of miles in my car. It's a 2016. I got 233,000 miles on it. And I thought, this car's going fine. I'm going to get 300,000 out of this car. And won't have to get another car. And Thursday after lunch, on my way back here, had an accident. Lady um, coming down 15th Street. Lady, you know how we do. It was yellow, and she thought she could make it. She beat the car on my left. The car on my right was slow. She and I tied. Now, um, y'all be proud of me. I was very pastorly. <laughs> I went over and I checked on her. She was shaking like a leaf. There had been an accident the previous week um, and she was going to check on the sister of the brother who died in an accident. So she was rushing to check on her friend. Her friend must have stayed in the box because she came out and they were both, they were both a mess. Not an evil woman, not a bad person, but in her rush to do a good thing, she forgot to account for all the other people who were moving through the world and how they were moving through it. And I guess as I'm a preacher, I'm supposed to have some profound lesson about that. So it's this, whenever you make your move, keep in mind other people are making moves too. And as the ancient philosopher um, Shirley Graves of Mississippi said, you can be a whole lot later if you get run over. So um, pray for your pastor and pray for what's going to be a new car note for your pastor. And please don't try to be lunchtime rush hour traffic on 15th Street in a Corolla. Not too often. Good morning, Bailey Tabernacle, Good morning. to everyone who's present and everyone who may be experiencing this service uh, through some virtual means, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or, how, or off our Facebook page or our website. Uh, we're just glad to be here this morning. We're so thankful that God brought us through the night. And though we're a little damp this morning, we're all good. Telling somebody in the back, it's like, thank God for the rain, because rain tends to make things softer. So I'm not all hard and crunchy this morning. I'm feeling nice and soft and pliable. And I'm just thankful to see so many of you here. And I'm thankful to hear reports from the pastor when he gives us thanks, thank you notes from all the people that we've been able to assist. And to actually hear that something that we are trying to do here is impacting things out in our community. And so with that, I just ask you to continue to be faithful, continue to be blessed, and to follow God's guidance. This is our offering time, and I said I was going to bring up a basket, but I may do it next time, just so we can have a visual. Sometimes our learning is best done through visual exposure. And things that we see tends to stay with us. So I said I was going to bring a basket up and let you see this basket and tell you how much we are able to do because of your visits to the baskets. So that during the week, when you're riding by yourself, maybe it'll help you to slow down on 15th Street. But it'll, it'll just help you to remember to keep God first in everything that we do, everything that he gives us, we should be sure to put him first when we start to distribute all the gifts that he's given us. Always be reminded of how good he's been to us. So today, just remember we have a basket at the front. 
and one over here to my left near the entrances and exits. You can also contribute via a virtual means. If you have a smart device, go to Givelify app or PayPal. Look up Bailey Tabernacle CME. Finally, you can also give your gifts and your donations by mail. Just send it to Bailey Tabernacle CME Church, PO Box 3145, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 35403. Thank you, Brother Dancer, for giving us a visual to remember that one of our elders took the time to walk up and put his offering in our basket, knowing that it's going to help somebody. So continue, please, to be faithful and join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we're so thankful this morning for all the things that you give us. Yes, Lord, we're also very thankful for the rain that you've provided us and all the benefits that it'll bring to us. Help us always, Lord, to keep our minds focused on you and all your goodness. We pray, Lord, that you will look down now and find favor with us and bless the gifts and the givers. Bless it in a special way, I pray, and help us, Lord, to distribute these gifts in the way that will be the most helpful to the most people throughout our community. Lord, we ask that you look down and bless the sick and the afflicted. Bless those, Lord, who are homeless. Help us to be blessings to all. And Lord, help us to always love one another. These are our prayers in your son Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Whatever you brought into this space, whatever is on your mind and on your heart, now is the time when you can share that with the Lord. As the Lord sits high and looks low, he tilts his head just a little bit toward these sanctuaries, anointed and called by his name. Like any good father, he listens to each of his children, but especially when his babies come together and call him. Maybe you come and you need to hear something special from the Lord. Something that has you distressed and you're wondering what the Lord has to say. Come and ask him to direct your attention and open your heart to what the word will be. Maybe you come carrying a situation of your own that's heavy on you. You're not sure what to do with it, how to carry it. Come and give it to the Lord. To take it from you, oh, he'll give you the strength to bear it up on you. Maybe there's somebody else you know who's praying for themselves but needs somebody else to pray for. Maybe that somebody isn't in a place where they even are able to pray for themselves and so you can pray for them and pray for them to find the spirit to pray. Whatever it is you need to say to the Lord. You can come to the altar here, those of you who are with us. And you can kneel. You can bow where you are. You can find a safe place and stop where you are. This is our altar call. God is listening. As the choir sings, you make up.
now it's love. Now it's love. Just gonna stop thinking y'all have topped out. Just 
I'm just going to stop. Or maybe I need to keep thinning because every time I think it, y'all go a little bit higher. Get along some praise for this choir. Amen. Somebody got to preach after that. Pray for me and pray with me. Father, we thank you for being so excellent. We thank you for all that you do in ways we are so just humble to see. We thank you for all you do in ways we can't imagine. Sometimes that even after we realize you've done it. You are excellent, Lord, and we praise you. We glorify you. We thank you, and we come to you in this moment asking you to speak. We are listening. Make every word of my mouth, cause every meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. But let me, Lord, get out of your way. Let me hide in the shadow of the cross. Let me rest in the cleft of the rock. Let all the focus in these next preaching moments be completely on Jesus. For whose sake and in whose name we pray. Amen. March is Women's History Month, and each Sunday I preach in this month, I'm focusing on some truth that is illustrated by the lives of women in Scripture. Through these messages, though they have a decidedly female emphasis, there are lessons and revelations for all of us, brothers, too. Last week we looked in the book of Judges at the actions of the prophetess Deborah and the great Israelite general Barak. Today, I want you to turn with me to the New Testament, to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 falls at an interesting point because it's between some leadership actions. Back in Luke chapter 6, Jesus had named the 12 men who would be the leaders, the apostles, among his many disciples. In Luke chapter 9, the Lord sent those 12 male apostles out into the field to do what we might think of as a semester of practicum, as we call in education, or clinicals, as they're called in the medical field. They did hands-on ministry, learning two by two how to apply what the Lord had been teaching them and showing them. But in between, in Luke chapter 8, we are introduced to the female leaders in Jesus' earthly ministry. Prior to the apostolic clinicals and for the benefit of both the male and female leadership of his ministry, Jesus gives them a set of powerful examples of hands-on ministry. Ministry directed deliberately at the distressed and the most distressing populations. And so the lessons we see today will challenge us as disciples of the modern age to, to reassess how we assign and how we subtract value from people. The miracles Jesus performed will call on us to consider where we've been getting our lessons from and realign with God. Because the title of today's message, centered in Luke chapter 8, is Sisters with Issues. Sisters with Issues. Luke 8, verses 1 through 3. Now it came to pass afterward that he, that is Jesus, went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and healed of infirmities, including Mary Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for Jesus from their substance. Couple of things. First, notice that Jesus had men and women working side by side in his traveling ministry. And second, note that Jesus employed several sisters with issues. Mary Magdalene was one of several women actively working in Jesus' ministry who had at one point been possessed by demons. And it's interesting that there are these different biblical words for demon possession. They include the anglicized term demoniac, i.e. a demonic maniac. 
In, in Matthew 4, 24, the King James uses the term lunatic. And in Matthew 4, 24, the New King James, you find the term epileptic. This exploration of terminology confirms that many of the most dedicated, many of the most trusted women in Jesus' ministry had previously suffered from incurable medical conditions, chronic disability, and mental illness. Mary Magdalene was one of those whose illness had been psychological. She, she's pointed out because before Jesus came into her life, to put it bluntly, Mary Magdalene had been seven kinds of crazy. And I hear the brothers thinking, see, I told you them church ladies was crazy. But, but let me point out that in the same chapter, just a few verses earlier or, or later, in Luke 8, 26, Jesus cast a legion of demons out of a man. A Roman legion consists on average of 4,800 men. So yeah, there were sisters in Jesus' ministry who were seven kinds of crazy. And there were brothers in the church who had 5,000 issues. That brothers with issues sermon is going to take a while long. But there is still, even today, so, so much stigma around disability and mental illness. Even when accommodations are available, even when psychological treatment has been successfully applied, and, and though that is cultural, it isn't biblical. After all, what is a saint but a sinner in recovery? One, one may be condemned to hell for sin, but not for anxiety or, or depression or disability. The recovering addict who gives her life to Jesus and stays clean is on solid spiritual ground. But the self-righteous Christian, who hates them fools who, who got mixed up in them drugs and, and thinks we ought to just round them all up and shoot them. That church member is on shifting sand. And that's not just my opinion, but in Matthew 5, 22, Jesus said, I say that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool will be in danger of hellfire. And Luke 8, 1 through 3, there's a timeline. Jesus had first encountered these women when, when they were some of them still sick, some of them still disabled, some of them like Mary Magdalene in the throes of mental illness, and some of them like Joanna in verse 3 were married to men who were working for the enemy. Joanna's husband, Chusa, was Herod's chief of staff. This is the Herod who had John the Baptist beheaded. This is the Herod who had, who had Jesus mocked and beaten. This is the Herod who, who made peace with Pontius Pilate after he had had Jesus executed. This is the Herod who in Acts 12 had the apostle James murdered, the church persecuted, and Peter arrested. And Joanna's mortgage was paid with Herod's blood money. And she was an active supporter of Jesus' ministry. Don't look so shocked. Some of y'all were completely out of the game when y'all got mad. Right. And I'm not picking at you because I understand. When I was in Head Start, sometimes the Head Start bus would drop me off at home. Sometimes the bus dropped me off next door at my grandparents' house. And sometimes the bus dropped me off in the quarters at what I call my daddy's shop. The shop was actually the town pool hall, which my pops owned and ran. And if you don't know what it means to run the town pool hall in the 1970s, stream some black movies from that era. You'll know which ones I'm talking about, because there'd be a dude in an afro and a fur coat probably holding a pistol. Some of the women in Jesus' ministry had issues because they had been real sick. Some had issues because they had been mentally ill. Some had issues because they loved the Lord, but they weren't totally, completely, technically, all the way out them streets. 
But God finds a way to use women and men with issues. Amen. Luke 8, 41. Jesus and his disciples, male and female, were doing traveling ministry around Galilee. Great multitudes gathered wherever Jesus went. The crowds got so thick that sometimes people had to climb trees just for a chance to maybe get a look at it. However, if, if, if you had enough status in the bodyguards, you could push your way through to the front of the line. And so a man named Jairus came and, and begged Jesus to come help his daughter at home. And Jesus started going. But in the thick of that crowd, Luke 8, 43 says, there was a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years. The King James calls this an issue of blood. It means that this system had been menstruating nonstop for 12 years. Verse 43 goes on to say that she had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any. Her period had been on for 12 years straight and she was bankrupt. I think it's safe to say that this woman had issues. But she'd heard that Jesus was a healer. You know what? That's not even quite right. She'd heard and believed that Jesus was a healer. But the crowd was so thick, but she kept on pressing. She struggled and struggled until she managed to get within sight of Jesus. And, and then he started leaving. Some rich guy. One of those synagogue rules. Going back the other way, and, and she thought, no, she was, I mean, think 12 years, and she was so close. And yes, she was screaming Jesus' name, but, but everybody was screaming Jesus' name. And she began to think, well, I don't need his full attention. He, he can heal with a word, he, he can heal with a touch. Maybe if I can just touch him, maybe if I can just touch his garment, maybe if I can just touch the hem of his garment. And in the midst of this striving crowd, she got down and reached out, managed to brush her hands along the edge of the robe as he passed by. And immediately, Luke 8 says, her flow of blood stopped. Her issue was instantly fixed. And before she could celebrate, Jesus stopped. Luke 8, 45, and Jesus said, who touched me? You ever been asked a question that was just a question? but it sounded like an accusation. This is one of those situations. Nobody had done anything wrong, but suddenly everybody started lying. I mean, they didn't, the script don't say they just kept silent, but says they all denied it. Huh, wasn't me, and you got your hand on him. No, wasn't me, I ain't touched nobody. Finally, Peter, and of course it was Peter. Peter says, um, Lord, uh, it's a crowd all around us. How are you going to say who touched me? Like, everybody touched you, Jesus. And he was like, no, no, no. Somebody touched me, touched me. All these folks touched me with their hands, but somebody touched me with their faith. And he said in Luke 8, 46, because I perceive power going out of me. You ever had somebody look at you so intensely, you imagined they were looking into your soul? Well, with Jesus, it wasn't imagination. So, so I'm thinking Jesus scanned the crowd and locked eyes with this woman, this woman who had touched him with her faith because it says that the woman saw that she could not be hit. Now imagine the silence when Jesus locks on. And then the mumbling underneath the silence. And she comes out. You know how crowds do. They kind of back up a little. And she comes forward and the scripture says she was trembling with fear. And she falls on her face before Jesus and she confesses everything. Confesses it as somebody who had committed a crime because to society and tradition she had. And then the mumbles start to get louder. And then, then the mumbles become exclamations of offense and, and disgust. Because in that society, in those traditions, a woman who was on a period wasn't supposed to go out in public. She, she wasn't supposed to be around folks. She certainly was never supposed to touch 
and dare to touch a man. And if she had to go out, she had to holler, unclean, unclean. So everybody knew to look at her and look at her badly. And she, she comes out and she's surrounded by this crowd. And she has to tell everybody that she has violated tradition. And, and she has touched all those people. And you can imagine a crowd like that, how they start to get angry. And they start to, start to get mad. And here is this woman with issues who could not expect grace or mercy because they could have stoned her. Because even then, it's easier for a man to get away with living his life wrong than for a woman. I did not say that it's always easy for a man to live down his mistakes. But I did say, and I do mean, that it is easier for a man to live down his mistakes than for a woman to live down hers. After all, boys will be boys but girls are supposed to be more mature. Young men get to sow their wild oats, but young ladies shouldn't want to get a bad reputation. Locker room talk doesn't count against you as long as it's the men's locker room. A man possessed with 5,000 issues so bad they'd make pigs commit suicide. He gets clean and is forever remembered as a miracle. But Mary Magdalene ain't got but seven issues and they still call her a prostitute and accuse her of sleeping with the past. This is how people do. But it should not be so among God's people. Our entire religion is based on the concept of redemption. We come to Jesus covered in sin, and by his blood, we are made clean. We come to Jesus heavy laden, and, and by his grace, he gives us rest. We come as we are. And he transforms us more and more into his holy likeness. We all show up bad. And Jesus makes us better. When you do somebody wrong, but then you truly repent, you truly change. Even after God forgives you, it may be a long, long time before the victim of your sin forgives you. Maybe they never will. But the church always should. The church should exercise grace and redemption. In 2 Corinthians 2, 5 to 11, Paul writes about a member of the Corinthian church who had done something wrong. We don't even told what. But the church, by majority decision, punished that man. But then they kept punishing him. They didn't let it go. They wouldn't allow the brother to move from penance to restoration. In other words, they didn't just punish him, they condemned him. The church has authority to bind and to loose. The church has authority to teach and to discipline. But the church and no church folk have authority to condemn. Only Jesus can save and therefore only Jesus can condemn. And so in 2 Corinthians 2 and 6, Paul writes, the punishment you've inflicted by majority is sufficient. It's, it's enough for the man. So, so you ought to rather forgive and comfort him now, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. That's enough now. He's sorry. He's asked for forgiveness. Stop piling on. Stop trying to break his spirit and bring him back in the fellowship. Remind him that he is still loved. And at the end of that passage, that's when Paul writes 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. When believers hold a man's past mistakes against him without grace, without mercy, without allowing for a chance of redemption, we are not doing God's work. We are falling into the devil's trap. Amen? Amen. Amen? Now, do you think that only applies to men and not equally to women? Society and tradition say a woman with issues has to stay away. Society and tradition says a woman with issues is unworthy of anyone's holy attention. Least of all, the attention of the Messiah himself. But the sister in Luke 8, fortunately, wasn't dealing with society and tradition. She was dealing with Jesus. 
And Jesus has a place for women with issues. The crowd is watching. The, the ruler of the synagogue is watching. The male disciples are watching. The female disciples are watching. And in Luke 8, 48, Jesus says, dog. Not sin. Not unclean woman. Not you woman. Dog. Be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Not how dare you want. Not, not, I know you good now, but when you touch me, you were wrong. Dog. Cheer. Well. Peace. You may have issues, sister, but you are a daughter of the Most High God, and God loves his daughters. You may have issues, brother, but you are a son of the Most High God, and God loves his sons. You, you may be depressed, but, but God can give you back cheer and joy because he loves you. You may be physically or mentally broken, but God can make you well and give you strength. You did not know it's possible because he loves you. You may be anxious or confused or in turmoil, but God can give you peace. Not the kind of peace the world gives, but a peace that passes understanding because God loves you. Be of good cheer. Your faith can make you well and you can go in peace. And I would point this out to you. Notice that Jesus healed her automatically. Didn't look at her. Didn't take an inventory of her. Didn't make her read the affirmation of faith and take a test on it and tell her whether he, she believed it. Didn't even require her to sign up her bank account so ties could be automatically deducted. Because she touched him with faith. The healing automatically responded. This is an example for the church. We can keep records, we can document, we can register, but never should we withhold ministry until someone has proven to us that they deserve it. We help heal the sick, not just the worthy sick. We help the homeless, not just the sweet homeless. We, 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 we meet sisters and we meet brothers when, when they are in the midst of their issues, when we hold ourselves up to the standard of Jesus and do what Jesus did and automatically offer joy and healing and peace and a restoration of relationship. Because it may be that the brother or the sister who comes to us with issues today is the leader that God has designed and anointed for us tomorrow. And isn't, isn't it good news? God has a place for women and men with issues. Because if the truth were told, and it's about to be, we all got some issues. We all got some stuff in us. That, yeah, you saved and sanctified, but there's some stuff that ain't clicking just right. And isn't it good news that even though you have issues, God doesn't wait until your issues are resolved, but he works on you automatically. Isn't it good news that even though we have issues, God doesn't care what the crowd says about us, how the crowd is bringing up our past, but God says, I want to heal you now. I want to give you peace now. My daughter, my son, forget what they're saying. Let me give you cheer. Let me give you wellness. Let me give you peace. Forget about the crowd and look to Jesus. The doors of this kingdom are You may not have any issues, but Beaver and Shirley Boy still does. And so I am grateful that God has not set me on the sidelines until all my issues are resolved. But he continues to use me while he works on me. Stand for me, stand for me. So you may have come into this moment thinking that because you still have some issues that there's no place for you in God's plan. I hope you see that the Bible says that's not how God works. You may have come into this moment and, and you were walking with God, but you've gotten off track and you let your issues pull you away and, and keep you from his healing. I hope you understand that even if it's been 12 long years, God wants you to come back. You may feel like, 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 like that move of the spirit is, is, is a voice of condemnation. But in fact, if you 
you look to God's eyes, you'll see he wants you to come to him as a daughter, as a son. He's not looking at you with condemnation. He's looking for you to come back to him. So if you're in this place and you need to come to Jesus, come. Forget about the crowd. Forget about everybody else. You come. If you've gotten away from him and you need to come back, come. If you need a church home, if you need a family of, of people who got our own issues, but we know we've seen what God does in our lives, come. Bailey's arms are open. We'll walk with you. We'll work with you. Because we remember how we've been redeemed. And we want God to do the same for you. He said one. It's the one who will come. It's the one. Tell me what can I do? Cause I can't live without you. I can't live without you. Oh, tell me what can I do? Cause I can't live without you. I can't live without you. Oh, tell me what can I do? Cause I can't live without you. I can't live without you. Oh, tell me, what can I do? Cause I can't live without you, Lord. I can't live without you. So here's my heart. Here is my mind. I give you my soul, Lord need you to take control because i tried it lord i tried it on my own but what i found is i can't make it on my own on my own i can't make it i can't make it on my own, on my own, I can make it, I can make it. What can I do? Cause I can live without you. Here is my heart, here is my mind, I give you my soul, Lord, I need you to take control, cause I tried it, y'all, I tried it on my own, but, but what I found is, I can't make it on my own, on my own.
Cause I can't live without you. I can't live without you. Oh, 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 oh. Cause I can't live without you. I can't live without you. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh, oh. preached already because I ain't no good now. Give the Lord some praise for our choir. There are, um, before the benediction, there are two pieces of business I neglected earlier today. Um, first, do we have any visitors with us? Would you wave? Do you want to introduce yourselves? Don't have to. Do you? Please. Thank you for being with us. Good morning. I'm Cheryl Wesley. I'm going to be reading from Alpha City Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. And I'm here also with Dr. Nelson. Amen. <laughs> you, you don't have to, but you want to. Okay. Amen. Amen. Well, on behalf of the church, thank you all for being with us. Um, think on the program as our contact information. Um, feel free to reach out to us. One more piece of business. Y'all have noticed a little change in the music lately. <laughs> uh, like, like there's like an extra layer of sound underneath there. Let me introduce y'all to somebody. Come on. <laughs> um, the new organist of Bailey Tabernacle CME Church, Brother Chad Jackson. Some of you know him. Some of you seen him around. You want to say anything? Uh, the music speaks for itself. Get a little surprise. There are so many. I hope y'all see it. I just hope y'all see it. There are so many ways God is moving here. So many things 
are are sliding into place and moving into a place that sometimes we didn't even anticipate we needed something in. And I just want you all to continue to be praying for the church. Please don't stop praying for your pastor. And I told y'all I got issues. I ain't just saying stuff. And, and just continue to serve. To find those places and spaces where you can. And if you don't know, if you got a, a thought, an idea, a vision, you feel a need, just holler at your pastor. Don't worry about it. If they going mm -mm, just holler at me. Amen? I love you, baby. Let us stand for the doxology of praise God from whom all blessings flow. and dwelling in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, may the grace and love of his Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, rest with you, abide in you, and go with you henceforth and forevermore. And with all of God's people, say together, Amen.